Today on This Week Health. Make it simple. We don't necessarily do that well in healthcare. Well, let's take data governance, data literacy. We make like this religious thing, right? We don't need to do that. Make everything practical, as practical as possible. And that helps with that buy-in from all the various stakeholders. If you come up with this religious dogma kind of approach, it's very, very difficult to get buy-in. But if you help everyone understand what the benefit is to the organization, the value of the organization, and then downstream and whatnot, that gives you a, a little bit better ability to get the buy-in. Thanks for joining us on This Week Health Keynote. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, a channel dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. Special thanks to our keynote show sponsors, Sirius Healthcare, VMware, Transparent, Press Ganey, Sempris, and Veritas for choosing to invest in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Today, we are going to do one of my favorite shows, which is we're going to hang out with Charles Boise and we're going to have a conversation. He's my go-to technology officer, data person, and whatnot. And we're going to talk all things healthcare. Charles, welcome back to the show. Hey, Bill. It's good to be with you. We did a show last year, a conversation between a CIO and a CTO. It was pretty well received. People were like, wow, that was interesting. You and Charles really went back and forth on some of those things. I'm I'm probably going to do the same thing with you today, but I, here's what I'd like to do before we do that is you have one of the most interesting careers uh, I can think of. And I want to, I want to sort of walk your resume like I would for an interview, sort of do a resume walk. You actually started in the nurse corps in the United States Army way back in the day. So you started off as a nurse way back in the day. Yeah, even I can even go further, you know, further back than that if you want. I actually started out as a paramedic, but I, I got tired of getting beat up by patients and I got tired of the rain coming down on me. And looking around in the emergency room in the hospital and whatnot, I go, hey, hey, there's a there's a roof over your head and I don't think anybody's gonna, you know, take me out in this environment. And that pretty much proved true. Yeah. Well, you didn't move too far from that combat zone when you moved into the uh... In, into the work world, you moved into the LA County Department of Health Services. What was that environment like? Well, that was pretty interesting, Bill. So that was LA County USC Medical Center, right in the, the thick of the things, especially back in the late 80s, all through the 90s. We had a you know 24 bed unit that was pretty much filled with gunshot stabbings and and other mayhem from man versus man. And we kept it you know pretty busy. Everybody was on a vent. Everybody was chemically sedated and paralyzed, so they were. It was a pretty tough group to to work with, but it was kind of interesting because you think about the criticality of those patients and whatnot, and it led to quite a bit of innovation from a data perspective. I actually saw this RS two thirty two port on the side of a monitor, and well, I plugged the cable into it, connected the computer up to it, and what do you know? I now had a feed of physiological monitoring data. So that's kind of really how it started for for me rs232 port i remember yeah. those the little anyway and actually you weren't there for a short period of time you were there for 13 years yeah i was there for you know quite some time and i got to work with some really uh, notable folks it's really interesting bill back then i worked with dr william shoemaker who really started the concept of critical care and the society of critical care medicine and believe it or not we were doing predictive models back in back in the late eighties, early nineties, but we didn't call it predictive models. We didn't call it AI machine learning, what we called it. Predictive called, models we, is as far back as I go. I don't know what you would call yeah. it. We called it math. <laughs> that's, that's what I love about you. Uh, just, just call it what it is. So AI it's, is basically it's, math at its core, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and to be honest with you, what did we face from a problem perspective? Math was, <laughs> wasn't accepted then, just like machine learning and AI. It's kind of getting accepted, of course, in healthcare and whatnot, but those that prescribe don't necessarily like to be prescribed to. So we really set it up for the, the machines to tell clinicians what to do. And that was probably not the best way to get adoption and whatnot, although we were very accurate and so forth. So we, we published our papers and whatnot, and 
what do you know, around 20, you know, 2014, 2015, it became popular again. So it's good to see that we're working with it. But from a healthcare perspective, it had its origins a few decades ago. So while you were there, those 13 years, you were staff nurse, nurse manager, assistant nurse manager, you worked the floor. Yeah. So yeah, I worked in the environment and then I ended up directing the environment in, in later years and whatnot. Absolutely. Wow. So then you head on over to City of Hope, great institution right across town, but it looks like you, you changed your role a little bit. Senior clinical project manager sure, and clinical project manager. What was the change? What was that about? Sure. So a lot of it was about getting out of the line of fire, literally, and then taking what I learned from an adoption of technology not necessarily an adoption of information systems, although we had them then, but really adoption of technology. And at that time, I also went back to Stevens Institute of Technology and got the requisite computer science technology management degrees and really studied how best to implement technology, whether it be actual physical technology or information systems in healthcare based on how the Air Force did it how logistics did it, financial and so forth. And so at City of Hope really helped them with the you know management of projects to ensure that there was adoption and ensure success. So those were you know really good, interesting years. And then also on the research side of things, really helped them with getting the requisite data in a in proper form for for research purposes. This was three year period, 2005 to 2008. What was the n- number one thing? Well, I mean, we could expand this beyond your career. Sure, sure. In terms of the rolling out and the implementation of projects, I'm not going to say data projects or technology, just projects in general in healthcare. What, what are some of the things that you learned that you think would benefit the community? Sure. I think back then, from a development side and from a you know, product side and so forth, and I learned this, the product isn't what's in your head. It's what the clinical staff needs, what the organization needs. So we did a lot of development back in that period of time. I'm not saying we, but we as an industry where we thought we knew better than what the folks actually you know, required. So then we would implement something and then it didn't necessarily work well within the workflow. It wasn't really the features and functionality that were top of mind, if you will. It's what we kind of, you know, pushed on the folks. So I think we've done a lot better job. What I learned then is make sure that you have all the requirements in order that you've brought in all the folks that are going to be participating so that they're participating from square one all the way through the the delivery of whatever the product is. So they, they have, they have ownership in it. And we're finding that now Bill with machine learning and in AI, you need to bring everybody in from the perspective of um, data. What, what's the data that we're going to be using? How was it cleaned up? What are the features that are going to be using in the model? What does the performance look like? And then ongoing optimization and so forth. So how can you expect, um, how can you expect clinical operations or even financial folks to rely on these machine learning products if they haven't been brought in from square one? It's, it's very, very difficult. Yep. You know, Charles, that's really interesting to me. I just got, off the phone. I, I do some coaching various uh, people throughout the industry and, and somebody was just calling me about the conversation was about standing up their digital program within their health system. And as I was sort of describing it to him, it's like what a consultant would do is come in from the outside and say, look, here's what a framework looks like for digital and here's the different areas and here's what you should focus in on. And there's a time and a place for that. But When somebody says, hey, we're thinking of standing this up, it's interesting how my mind immediately shifts to, all right, you need to get a coalition of the willing. You need to get a coalition of people from your health system into a room and and get them to buy in on what it would look like or just to have the conversation. And, And so a lot of getting these projects off the ground is really identifying those people, bringing those people together, identifying the champions creating the frameworks for these things to flourish, for communication to happen, for ideas to be exchanged, uh, for buy-in to happen. People don't buy into things that they're just handed. 
they generally don't, they only buy in if they've been able to speak into it. And that's, as you were talking, that's one of the things that just struck me that um, I don't remember learning, but as soon as I got into healthcare, I learned it very quickly. <laughs> we'll get to our show in just a minute. As you've probably heard, we've launched a new show, Town Hall, on our community channel, This Week Health Community, and it airs on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'll be taking a back seat to some of these people who are on the front lines. Town Hall is hosted by an array of talented healthcare leaders who are facing today's challenges head on. We're going to hear from professionals and their networks on hot button issues, technical deep dives, and the tactical challenges that healthcare faces we have some great hosts on this. We have Charles Boise and Angelique Russell, data scientists, Craig Richerfield, Lee Milligan, Reed Steffen, who are all CIOs. We have Jake Lancaster and Brett Oliver, who are CMIOs, and Matt Sickles, a cybersecurity first responder. I'd love to have you listen to these episodes. You can subscribe on our community channel, This Week Health Community, wherever you find and listen to podcasts. Now, let's get to the show. Make it simple. We don't necessarily do that well in healthcare. We, well, let's take data governance, data literacy. We make this like this religious thing, right? We don't need to do that. Make everything practical, as practical as possible. And that helps with that, you know, buy-in from, you know, all the various stakeholders. If you come up with this religious dogma kind of approach and whatnot, it's very, very difficult to get buy-in. But if you help everyone understand what the benefit is to the organization, the value of the organization as well as the value to the individual departments and then downstream and whatnot, that gives you a, a little bit better uh, ability to get the buy-in. So talk to me about data governance a little bit. We're going to get back to your resume here in a minute, but it's interesting when you talk about religion, data governance was something that we had to stand up. When I came into the health system, it, it, it to say it was non-existent would be, would, would be overstating it, but to say that it was a defined practice within the system would not be understating it. I mean, it was not a defined practice. It was sort of ad hoc sort of happening if you look at the maturity models that are out there. And one of the things that happened to us probably about a year into it is it became a religion very quickly. And there was the head of the religion who made sure that people stuck to the dogma of, of data science. And it did become it became onerous within the organization. We had to, we had to step that back and redo it because we weren't getting the adoption. We, we, it's kind of funny because we had this very top down, this is how it's done. And, um, and you would think you'd get more adoption, but we got less adoption. And so we had to step back, build, build a different model that had a lot more uh, inclusivity throughout the organization. How do you keep, what does data governance done right look like? Sure. So governance is a horrible term, right? Nobody wants to be governed to a point, right? So you hear the term, you know, data literacy, right? So probably a better way to describe, you know, what we're currently doing is from a data literacy perspective and what, you know, in helping folks understand what's the value of having this type of a program. Let's take providers, for instance, the provider information can be in hundred plus applications within a healthcare organization. And it's usually wrong in 150, but by putting a certain literacy to that governance to that and getting a source of truth and whatnot, then we can make it correct through the hundred plus applications, but you have to help all the way down from the user perspective on up, understand what the importance is in participating because nobody wants to be in that room where we've got 50, 60 folks and we're putting data visualizations on screen and somebody says, Hey, that's wrong. Right. And they're right. It, it is wrong. So it's, it's really important going forward. Also you know, from a pure calculation perspective, you want to know what the source systems were. You want to know the whole lineage, right? So at the end of the day, everybody's in agreement. Not only that, what data do we have available and where the hell is it? That's really important as, as well. And that's not well understood. And then you end up with data marts, data warehouses on top of data warehouses on, and so forth. And it just gets super fragmented and whatnot. And then pulling everything back. Nobody did this stuff unintentionally. They did it out of need because there wasn't something in place. But unfortunately, just like Six Sigma, you know, healthcare took it and kind of 
went a little crazy with that. Yeah, the systems I've seen that do data governance really well, they get buy-in through case studies on their own data, on their own sure. stuff. And it's interesting, they'll, they'll go in the first time and sort of talk to the executive team or maybe even the board. And they'll say, this is what the data says. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. If that data is right, then that person's dead. And it's that kind of, we've all seen that example, right? Where, where some clinicians looking at it going, is that really what the data says? Yeah, that's what the data says. That person's dead. <laughs> it's like they can't, they can't have that. That reading is impossible. And so they, they just put the study of, hey, here's what the data looks like. I'm just showing you what the data looks like. And it gives people a, a window into what actually exists behind there. And they go, well, we're not going to be able to do anything with that. And then they step back and go, okay, let me tell you what we need to put in place in order for this to be effective. But then they continue to come back to the board or the executive team and they go, okay, we're ready to show you what we've been able to do in this area with this data. And they slowly begin to see the power of data in one area or two areas or three areas. And then they start to really expand. I think everybody wants to just say, all right, we're going to get our data clean and then we're going to be able to do it all. I haven't seen that. I mean, I haven't seen that work that well. Yeah, it's, it's an exercise. You got to keep, you got to keep doing it. I mean, you absolutely do. And then you have to put some nuances in there to make it work right for whatever the, the department is that's initially doing it. Uh, the way it's worked outside of healthcare, it's usually been taken up by a, a department and then every other department within the organization sees their success based on it. And then, hey, how can I participate? So then you become a clinical informatics officer. Is that like the precursor to, I mean, what, what is that a precursor to today? I think you're CDO or your chief analytics officer. And this was for the, the county of Riverside. There, the county hospital in, in Riverside. I went in there to, I spent 18 months putting them on a path, a pathway of a digital transformation. This one actually, Bill, this is going to crack you up. They were actually using CRT tubes back in that organization. So they may yeah. still be, it, it's they, still possible. No, no, no. I'll tell you the, if you ask me, what did you do there that really makes you the, the happiest? I gave, there's some cost in this in the coding department for the coding of, you know, the uh, post discharge. They had these like 13, 14 inch CRTs. I brought in 20 inch flat screens. And I boosted their productivity about 60% because they're able to put all their applications on two screens. That's, the, that's the, the, the best. And I took a, I took, what was it? Cabletron from a network perspective. Oh yeah. yeah. I brought that. Yeah. I brought them into the you know, 21st century from a, from a network perspective and then just from a, you know, physical infrastructure. So that was a, a real fun opportunity to take somebody to take an organization and, and move them, move them forward. Yeah, I, I like I like going into things that are really messed up, to be honest with you, because the only way to go is up. And it, it is kind of fun that way. You go from there, you go over to UCI. This is where we finally met, Informatic Solutions Architect. And you started doing some fun, some fun things at UCI. What are some of the things you did at UCI? Sure. I think what being back in an academic environment allowed me to get back into research, but it also allowed me to reach out. And this is around 2010, reach out to the folks at Google, Twitter, you know, LinkedIn and Yahoo. And Bill, I really saw uh, a correlation between healthcare and those entities, if you will. I know that sounds a little bizarre, but if you think about your LinkedIn profile, it's no different than a pathology report or radiology report. If you look at, you know, Twitter, not much different than streaming HL7 messages. And if you think about what Facebook is, what Facebook is temporal. So every year, everything you've done, it gets, you know, compartmentalized or, you know, put into a folder, whatever you want to call it. So no different than episodes of care. So how can you take those technologies into, into healthcare and do better from a data perspective? And then Yahoo is another one that, you know, is very, very instrumental in some really early technologies. So what it allowed me to do at UCI, which is really cr critical, is bring in everything not just the clinical financial operational, but bring in the research data, bring in the images, bring in genomics data. And what do you know? Bring in the data external. So air quality, temperature, humidity, we call it exposome data. 
everything from the house and, and social media data. I mean, we had live feeds of all the social media about what's being said about UCI, what's being tweeted from the hospital, all of that. It's very, very interesting time to put all those technologies together and actually um, do something with them. Can we still do that stuff today? Can we still see yeah. what people are tweeting about our hospital? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's sentiment analysis. And we all should be. And some of my favorite ones from healthcare organizations I wasn't affiliated with. I've got, oh, Bill, I can show you next time. I've got a library of sleeping clinicians that family members have taken pictures of. And then, hey, I'm at so-and-so <laughs> facility. This is why nobody's taking care of my mom. Yeah, that still goes on, Bill. Absolutely. Uh, no, number one thing that's tweeted about hospitals. What's that? Food. Oh yeah. I've got a, a food library as well. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, can you believe they're trying to nurse me back to health and they gave me this food? I, although I think but, the food food's gotten better over the years. No, And Bill, it's not always negative. There is some great stuff that healthcare organizations don't realize that's being communicated by other patients and, and family members. So don't think it's negative. A lot of it is absolutely positive. But if something negative comes out, you want to get in front of it. If something positive, you want to actually publish that fact. So there is a role for that still. Well, this is the evolving role of marketing. In a bunch of organizations, if something is negatively said about, let's say, Chick-fil-A, they get a response from the internal They're marketing on. team within minutes. Are we ever going to get to that spot within healthcare where... Somebody tweets something and we go, hey, I'd love to reach out and talk to you about that bill that you don't understand. Yeah. No, Bill, I think even more than that, yes, that data is important, but we're now applying you know, machine learning and AI to understand what patients are likely to churn. By looking at our data, how well are we doing with referrals? Are we doing really good with referrals? How well are we doing with scheduling? If we're going to schedule people out a little bit too far, well, guess what? It's no different than a restaurant reservation. I'm going to get on the phone and, and find out if I can get myself scheduled, you know, somewhere else quicker. If I've just been diagnosed with, you know, some type of, you know, condition and I'm all freaked out about it and I'm being told that I can't be seen for another two weeks, I'm not going to be okay with that. I'm going to go get on the line. So by having all this data in one place and it being true, we can do these exercises now and then do these reach outs and whatnot. And I think I've talked to you about it before. I'm finding patients in patient populations that are diabetic and hypertensive that aren't being treated because we don't have the awareness that, you know, these patients are actually have those conditions and whatnot. So that's kind of what's cool about what we can do, you know, now versus a few years back. The, the, the power of data right there. During this time at UCI, got the entrepreneur bug again. It says co-founder, chief innovation officer for social health insights. So they, they gave you the, the runway to go ahead and start something up within that organization. Yeah. yeah. And what that was really was a department of health and human services, put a call out for somebody to build out an application that could monitor social media in real time for disease outbreak. Um, I think there was 300, uh, 300 plus entrants and we actually and that led to uh, a whole series. That application is actually used by you know CDC, World Health, and, and others. It really led to a lot of opportunity to you know further pursue that type of of activity and whatnot. We even got involved in you know some of the DoD and and and, and NAS and, and and others. So that was that was really interesting. It was really interesting to look back at the pandemic and to, to read some of the articles about what we could tell from Google searches, what we could tell from social media posts. Like we could take that information and look at the outbreak that as it was going across the country and the, the different spikes across the country, the social media searches yeah. and that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a good predictor of it's what's real, actually- it's real, it's real time, Bill. That's, we were able to do, help people understand what outbreaks were going on and what diseases were, what was happening in real time, because there's some latency in reporting. So the hospital reports locally, the local report to the CDC, but family members are like on it right now. Oh my God, my kid's got, you know, meningitis. And then in the same area, a hospital a few miles away, same thing. And then another one. And what do you know? They were all in, you know, same places, but that would have never been able to 
be well understood unless you're able to get that data in a, in a real-time perspective. Will health system set up a social listening outpost for future pandemics, do you think? They should. They absolutely should. Yeah. That's, um, that's... Is the tech there? Is the application there? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you talk sentiment yeah. analysis, you can get that with any number of tools at this point. Some are expensive. But you can get that with yeah. a bunch of different tools at this point. But one of the things I want to point at at UCI, and then we'll get to Stony Brook, is uh, save two and a half million utilizing open source and low cost commercial software. You decided to build out the data infrastructure at UCI with open source software. Was that driven by money or was it driven by capability? I mean, what drove Sure, that? what brought that on? Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, again, I'm because, not... because a lot of health systems are just, hey, Microsoft's got it. Boom, we're just going to head, we're going to keep on this path. Sure. It had to do with skill sets, skill set um, within, within the USI env environment, but not just myself, but I had, you know, other colleagues that were, you know, highly skilled. The University of California, Irvine, I think we have, I can't remember how many Nobel, you know, laureates, if you will, but a lot of them att att attacked on the computer science side of things. So we had the right skill set there to do that. Not all health systems, you know, have that skill set. And, and it's really important, Bill, back then, the technology was somewhat linear fashion. It's not linear and the need's not linear anymore. It's now an exponential situation where the technology is improving exponentially and the need for the technology is exponential. So you can't necessarily go out and build it yourself. At this point in time, some can, but most can't because you need it now. You don't need it in 18, 24 months when you're going to, it's going to be too late. So, so the drivers are, are a little bit different, but yes. So I had the right from the board level all the way down the right, you know, folks that gave it, you know, a thumbs up. This is really helping our mission. This is really, really beneficial to the organization. So, and then. Bill, I did what is now called app rationalization or archiving to fund myself. So I took all their systems, archived them, made them available. And, you know, that savings ended up in, in, in my project. So a lot of what I do now in healthcare organizations to, to fund the work is to get them, you know, down that path. Yeah, I've, I've heard that approach used several different ways, but you, you come in and you essentially say, Look, you don't have to increase the IT budget at all. Just let me keep my savings. And app, app rat, application rationalization ends up being a great way to find that savings pretty pretty quickly. quickly. The, the challenge is archiving and a, building an effective interface to go back into that archive data. So I assume that's part of the work that you had to do. Yeah. So you, it's not enough just to make it usable for HIM. And clinical, it has to be used in, for perpetuity. And why is that important? Because from a machine learning AI perspective, six months, a year, two years, if I can get 20 years, my models are going to be better. And I'm going to be able to understand how things change over time from a temporal perspective. So archiving into PD, it's great for HIM, maybe for clinical, but it's not so great for what we need to do going forward. I always talk about this, Bill, and it's really important we don't know all of the features that are going to provide value to certain models going forward. We think we do, but we don't necessarily know. And we find more and more that the more features that we're able to throw into this and find value from those features, the better the model performance. So you go to Stony Brook Medicine, Enterprise Analytics Architect. Sounds an awful lot like your previous title. Looks like you did a bunch of the same things. You you saved about 3 million utilizing open source, low cost commercialized software on the analytics solution. What, what's something distinctive that you did? I, to, uh, talk about how you interacted with that community within New York sure. in terms of, of data and research and sharing. I think a couple of things. One, the district project had just kicked off. We had done that in California for seven years and that was a a CMS program to, you know, better care to the, 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 the Medicare, Medicaid patients. And for Suffolk County, I think the most instrumental thing 
And what I learned the most from is we, we actually connected to over 400 systems, different systems, Bill. So the technologies that um, were required to pull data from all these different systems, a lot of them we know, but a lot of them systems that were built in garages and whatnot. So it was kind of an interesting time from that perspective. The other thing that we did that is really essential from a research perspective is having all the data in one place so researchers could access it and not get into long conga lines from individual stewards. So there's nothing worse than coming up with a hypothesis and then waiting, have to wait six months for the data. If you're able to come up with a hypothesis and then have access to the data, of course, and all the proper security regs and all that kind of good stuff, and then go forward with your research. I think that was secondary to what we were able to do in that environment, making data available for research. Define that term real quick, making data available. Was that through sure. uh, a set of analytics tools they could they could access it? They, I assume they're not sure. downloading it, right? No, it was, it was actually, Put it, setting up an environment where a researcher could, we all know this as a virtual desktop environment, right? Uh, VDI. So, and this also helps from a regulatory perspective of not having to worry about, does a researcher have a, a server underneath their desk or do I have a bunch of data on a zip drives and things of that sort? So basically they logged in, they had all the tools they needed, whether it was R, Python, SPSS, Jump, whatever that needed to be, as well as they had all the data that was required and they could bring in collaborators into this environment. So from a data perspective, it was, I call them the data roach hotel. The data went in, but it couldn't come out. So they couldn't take the data out and do anything with it on um, their collaborators. But from a research perspective, from a research associate and from an expense, all they had to do was buy their RAs Chromebooks. That's all you needed was a keyboard in a screen. So they were able to do all of their work in a minimal cost environment. And then everything was safe. Everything was accessible. They did their, what they needed to do and it was powered. You know, if you're running Python and you need to do XG booth on your laptop, not so well, but if you have a bank of GPUs that can be dedicated to the work that you're doing, absolutely made for a great research environment. Pretty, pretty elegant solution. Then you, uh, while you're at Stony Brook, you start to become a part of the professor community, molding the minds of the next generation of analytics professionals, teaching classes like healthcare data visualization, big data technologies and healthcare, applied healthcare analytics. You just finished a class, I would assume, since we're, we're almost at the end of a semester. Did you teach this semester? Yeah, we're doing our group projects right now. So, um, We've changed the, the course a little bit. So data visualization, absolutely in healthcare, is absolutely essential. So these classes, Bill, are applied classes. Very little theory, but all application. And the emerging technologies is kind of what we you know, just talked about, what I've been doing for the last 15 years or so. But on the advanced analytics, it's now a Python course. It's actually an introductory to data science. And we're actually teaching clinicians on. I just finished last week at the American Nursing Informatics Association. I just finished a one-day Python class. So at the exit, those nurse informaticists had a general view, uh, a general practical ability to work within a Python environment, which is pretty cool. Who better than clinicians to do this stuff? I'm a very, I'm an advocate of teaching physicians and um, and nurses and other practitioners data science. They should be part of that team. So, so yes, I still teach it. I'm still affiliated with you know, other universities, but I'm very passionate about clinicians being involved in data science. They have 80% of what a data scientist is. The other 20% is um, statistics. They got that. And the other 20 is programming language. And I can teach that. Interesting. What, what's the placement? I assume the placement rate coming out of Stony Brook's this program around clinical health, uh, informatics and whatnot, I would assume that placement rate is pretty high. The placement rate is extraordinary. Everybody gets placed and we do that as part of our, as part of our practice. So they're all placed in internships over the last year into the summer. 
and many of them get picked up in those internships. Those that don't um, get picked up, you know, pretty quick. And we help them with, you know, putting their portfolio together, mock interviews. Is this graduate level or is this undergraduate level? No, this is graduate level, but they've already, many of them were in the, in the bachelor's program and then they graduate to the, the master's program and they're absolutely ready to go. And there's a smattering of clinicians and the rest are non-clinicians, but they've had six years in a healthcare environment. Co-founder, chief innovation officer for ClearSense LLC. So you're back at it again. This is what you're currently doing. How did this one come about? Was this something where you're at one of the health systems and you say, there's a great need here? Or is this one of those where you went out and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to solve a problem that exists within healthcare? Well, Bill, for this story, you're absolutely involved in it. So I was at Stony Brook. I'm from Southern California. Didn't do well. In, didn't do well at all. So you actually offered me a position with your organization. But somehow in transit, these folks down here in Florida kind of got a hold of me and convinced me to, to start co-found ClearSense with them. And the reason and the thing for me, and you know this, Bill, I want to reach as many people as possible with this technology. I really believe this technology is universal. And I think this technology will help what I call in the digital disparity. Why do the, the more af, you know, known organizations have the tech and why can't the, you know, the safety nets and others have the tech? So I got a commitment to do that. Also got a commitment to make it you know, fairly reasonable for folks to get into. And then I don't know something about the cost of living in Florida versus Southern California. So I came here, but Bill, we definitely connected. You brought me into your organization and, and it worked out. So I thank you for that. It's just, we've kind of stumbled there for, for a little bit of time. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause if you remember, cause I remember vividly you turning me down the company, we were going to stand up when I was at St. Joe's, we had a incubator, we were standing up companies and we already had a name. It was called census. And I think we even had the URL. I think we had census.com was going to be the URL for the company. And, and to be honest with you, the business model was based on data. It was very yep. similar to what was going on here. But it's, and back in the day, if you go back to, you know, 2015, 2014, 2013, we were really struggling with the data. How far have we come? Are we still seeing those same kind of gaps of the haves and the have nots with regard to their data expertise? Yes. Yes, we are. The other thing that we're seeing and what we're solving for is to make this automated as much as possible. And what I mean by that is when you bring in a data source, let's say that's coded and whatnot, why does a human being have to validate that? When you're looking at PHI, why does it a human being have to go figure that out? Provider attribution, why does a human being have to figure that out? All these different techniques that we use that were primarily handed by data engineers, why aren't we processing that from a, a RPA perspective? So we've taken, and what I built, what I've always done is gone and looked at the industries that were ahead of healthcare and bringing that technology in, whether it be logistics, finance, retail. So what have they been doing that's sped their you know, processes up? What, what did Amazon do to get it from the, I want to buy a book to the book is delivered and cut off cut out all those middle processes and whatnot. So we're doing the same thing with data. And that really is my you know, mission to get it from a, a raw state to a curated state as quickly as possible with as little human intervention as possible, other than the QC checks and whatnot. All right. So I save this till the end. We were going to do a Newsday episode. We ended up doing a, a, a keynote episode. But I still want to talk to you about some of the things that are going on in the world. You started in the clinic as a nurse. There's clinician burnout was what we were saying before. But now we have this story in the news of a nurse committing suicide while working at Kaiser, actually committing suicide on their shift. We have employees walking out, unions striking and that kind of stuff because of conditions. How are we going to get through this? For the last two years, we've been pushing the nurses at a, probably an alarming pace in a very difficult situation. 
What's it going to take to get to the other side where we return to a whatever a normal workload looks like and really try to put the right parameters in place around mental health and sustainability of the, the nurses in, in their environment? Sure. And, and Bill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak for uh, colleagues with a disclaimer that I have not been at the bedside for quite some time, though on a, a daily basis, I do work with those that are providing you know, that care. I think that's, that's, that's really important. So the last couple of years absolutely have been extremely, extremely tough, especially on you know, nursing and so forth. And what can we do doing forward? I've got colleagues at, at Vanderbilt that have put together programs to minimize the amount of interaction, let's say within the EMR, did we take a minimalist approach? No, we didn't. We did not take what is actually required from a documentation perspective, regardless of the discipline to ensure you know, proper and adequate care. We looked at the EMR as a way to throw everything but the kitchen sink into it. And then if you look at it, because we can, what's actually being used? What's being used of that data? And is it worth even bothering with? And what we're finding out, the answer is no. If you look at the data sets, look at how many, excuse me, order sets, look at how many order sets have been created. You go back and you, you look at the utilization of, of those order sets, it's minimal. So, you know, what the heck, what are we doing? So what does that look like from a tech perspective? Are we there yet to, actually listen to every patient interaction, follow every clinician and whatnot, so that can be documented. There's a lot of folks that are trying to do that, not necessarily have been successful. I think it goes back to the basics, uh, Bill, understanding what the workflow is, what the work workload is, and then minimizing whatever we can from a process perspective to ensure we have the proper patient outcomes. And ensure that adequate staffing and all of that there's a there's legislation i mean california has a staffing ratio there's many that do but it's just something that we need to think about when we're implementing technologies because we're the technologists right we're the information system what can we do to minimize the impact on the the workload do we really need to bring this system in do you really need to document on this is that really required Again, my approach has always been minimalist built. It's interesting to hear you talk about the minimalist approach. It's also interesting to watch what Dale Sanders is posting out on social media in terms of the measures. It's like, do we need these measures? Let's start, let's step back and start to strip away some of these things that the federal government is asking for that we have to document that quite frankly goes into a black hole and it's not used anyway. Yeah, Bill, even, even from our own organizations, there's nothing more maddening than seeing that we've met a certain quality measure for the last 10 years at 98%. Well, let's get rid of those and let's get something in there that we may not be thinking about that's less than whatever it might be. Let's focus on what we need to, to focus on. And then from a quality measure perspective, we can do those quality measures in real time. Why are we doing them retrospectively? Why are we having these meetings where we're looking at something that happened three months ago? We should be building that out from the, in the here and now, people should be monitoring that in real time. We can monitor this stuff in real time so that when the patient leaves, they're at 98% or whatever it is. And we're not doing this retrospective stuff. There's no right. need to do, yeah, you got very, it. Very short, very short bursts on two topics. One, health IT tech investment has gone way down in the first quarter. I don't know if that's a, a new trend that we are going to see. And then the second is, we're seeing some significant hits here. And, and you and I were talking earlier and you mentioned two of them. We talked about Teladoc on the news day show last week. And we talked about the fact that they had to take a write down based on their acquisition of Livongo and just the, the actual value that had to be written down. There was a Anyway, the, the, it's just a, an accounting principle of you can't show the value of, of it. That's what you paid over and above. Then you take a, a hit on your financial. So Teladoc took a significant hit. Their stock's down 30 some odd percent. Health Catalyst from when it went public, I think is half of what it was when it first went public. 
are we seeing a slowdown? Are we seeing companies be valued for something other than their future potential and being more valued on what they're actually delivering in terms of revenue and value to the, to the market? I think what we're seeing is the VCs and the private equity over the last couple of years have brought on people to their organizations that really know healthcare IT. And what we saw from a COVID perspective, anything that happened to do with telemedicine or even close to it, of course, everybody went crazy and, and it spiked and whatnot. And what the PE folks and the, the VC folks are looking at right now is what is it going to look like for your organization? If you're a startup or you've been around for a couple, three years, what is that going to look like in a year from now? And then potentially in, in two years from now, and is it, is it best for me to invest or do I just, you know, hang on to it? Let's see how some of these do. There was an extraordinary amount of investment over the last couple, three years. And like you said, just in the last, you know, few months, there's been a little bit of a, a pullback. There's still investment, but they're, they're making very, very well informed decisions on who they think is going to, you know, make it versus yeah. not make it. Yeah. And you know what, I, and I don't want to paint a picture that I believe there's a significant pullback. I think there is going to be a pullback. I think there's a lot more discernment as you talked about, they're bringing in people who really understand healthcare. And now we're, instead of hearing these stories that we sort of scratch our head and go, you and I will hear some of these startups and they'll t say their story and we'll walk away from the booth and go, yeah, that's not going to make it. I mean, like we just know intuitively that's not going to yeah. make it. Well, the VCs, the private equity have those kinds of, uh, that kind of expertise available now. And they're, they're not just throwing money just to be in the $3 trillion space, if you will. Last one, Truveta. So Truveta has my data in it. It's a consortium of about 15 to 20 health systems, large health systems that are bringing all their data together for the good of mankind, right? For the sharing and whatnot. The thing I wanted to ask you about is, if I were on their board, if I were in one of the 15 investors, because it is a separate company, a separate entity, they're hiring a bunch of Microsoft people. So the, the leader is Terry Meyerson. He's from Microsoft. They're chief data officers from Microsoft. And we see this happen from time to time where people come in from outside of healthcare and they go, oh, we got this. It's a, it, We've got this. We, we know how to handle data and that kind of stuff. What are the gotchas that a team from outside of healthcare might run into if they're not familiar with maybe some of the things that are specific to healthcare? Sure. And I understand the affinity for Microsoft. Healthcare is predominantly Microsoft. So totally understand that. One of the things that I think is, is going to be really important for them. And I talk about the, the ethical and responsible use of data. And these are very large data sets with many, many members of the U S population. And from a research perspective, during the research, there are going to be, um, there are going to be things that are found out from patients that I talked about it earlier that were not known. So the ability to tokenize this information and leave tokens at each individual organization so that if there is something that is discovered by researchers, they can get that back to that provider. They can get that back by the to prevent to the patient. I think that's absolutely essential. And then understanding from a, a rare disease perspective, how to properly handle, you know, rare diseases so that those patients don't end up being identified in time. I think that from, you know, me as a researcher, I think this is a great opportunity from research, from pharma and from others, but just for the healthcare organizations to understand that their patients are consenting, you know, to this for purposes of, of the greater good. And I, I do agree with the, the concept of the greater good, but understanding that, you know, that, that the, the data is clean once they get it, or they have the proper uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that the data is clean, that the patients are who they should be. You know, all the, you know, the fraud stuff has been, you know, eliminated. The dedupes have all been taken care of. Patients are properly, you know, attributed. All of that is in place to ensure that the the quality is there, and again, that this data is being used in a ethical and responsible manner. So, one last question: While I have you here, what directionally? What's the future of healthcare? What's what's the future from the seat that you're sitting in right now? 
And, and Bill, no one can say it better than Thomas Edison said it in the mid 20s. And I'm going to quote him directly, but this is really where, where my focus is now from a career perspective going forward. This is really what I'm concentrating on. And it's a quote that I've had with me since my time at the bedside, but it's accurate and we'll be able to do it, I believe, sooner than, than later. And his quote is the following, the doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, diet in the cause and prevention of disease. He said that almost a hundred years ago, Bill. And I think we've never had the technology to actually do that, but we do now. And that's really what I'm going to work on for the rest of my career. And that's engaging people, not in healthcare, but in health. I mean, it's engaging, engaging me in, in educating me, engaging me, giving me the tools I need to be healthy. Absolutely. Because right now, we don't deliver and we haven't delivered health care. We deliver sick care. People come to us when they're sick, period. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Appreciate it. As always, All Charles, right. great to talk to you. All right. Thanks, Bill. What a great discussion. If you know someone that might benefit from a channel like this, from these kinds of discussions, go ahead and forward them a note. I know if I were a CIO today, I would have every one of my team members listening to a show like this one. It's conference level value every week. They can subscribe on our website, thisweekhealth.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Overcast, everywhere. Go ahead, subscribe today. Send a note to someone and have them subscribe as well. We want to thank our keynote sponsors who are investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Those are Serious Healthcare, VMware, Transparent, Press Ganey, Sempris, and Veritas. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.